I'm very shy, and I don't like being on stage, although I think I've been up here about 500 times in the last few years. Mike, where are you? Okay, you and I have to have lunch, all right? Because what you're doing for the environment, I'm doing, trying to do for HIV AIDS. I'm very grateful for that I am just here, but I must tell you that, really, I would like to be a tall, blonde rock star. Um, Serena, I love you. I don't think she's here anymore, but that was wonderful. So in my next life, I'm going to be tall, and I'm going to have long, straight, blonde hair. I'm a family doctor, I'm a mom, and I'm a Canadian AIDS activist. What does hashtag mean before I continue? <laughs> you have to know that I'm a different generation than most of you in this room, and I'm totally inept at social media stuff, so someone later has to tell me what hashtag means. I was born before the dawn of ultrasound technology on November 22, 1963. My mother was on her way to her obstetrician's office for her seven-month appointment. She had a little indigestion, and my dad encouraged her to get there early. When she arrived, she promptly delivered my brother on the waiting room floor. They wheeled her into the delivery room to the deliver the placenta, please excuse my medical terms, and much to the doctor's surprise, out came baby number two. My father and three older siblings were hunkering down under a massive snowstorm. It was November, and there was a snowstorm. There used to be snowstorms from November to April. They aren't happening anymore. My oldest brother burst open his bedroom window and announced to the neighborhood that we had been born, the 1963 version of text messaging. <laughs> Unfortunately, no one was listening. They were all glued to their black and white television sets. The world had just witnessed the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Growing up, I was always fascinated by JFK and that word, assassination. I was raised by hardworking European immigrants, like many of those in my generation. We didn't have much, but neither did any of our neighbors, so we didn't know a difference. The world was a different place back then, more wholesome and more decent. I remember being, being very excited when our family purchased a long cord for our rotary phone. Yes, phones were attached to the wall. And yes, you had to take the cord and try to have a, a private conversation. And in order to do that, I would squeeze really tight between the wall and the fridge to try to talk to some friends without anyone hearing me. We purchased our first color TV when I was nine. There were 13 television stations and six NHL hockey teams. Speaking of the NHL, just for a minute, in the 1967-68 season, Bob Orr, one of the greatest uh, Canadian hockey players, had an annual salary of $30,000. Derek Sanderson, another hockey great, earned $10,000. The highest earning player this year made 12 million. The changes have been astronomical. We used to spend the evenings outside with strict instructions to be home when the streetlights came on. Kids played outside. We used to skin our knees because we fell off our bikes all the time. We used to take our shoes off and hit the pavement in April when it was still cold so that we could be barefoot all summer. And then there was an award for the person who had the toughest feet. The Heart and Stroke Foundation did not need to release guidelines recommending that children exercise an hour a day. What is that? What is that? We were allowed to watch Wal the Waltons on Saturday night and the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday nights. The TV was never on otherwise. No one had a home computer or a massive flat screen TV. Kids weren't consumed by handheld devices. Communities were close-knit. You knew who your neighbors were, and very few people did without. The world was a very different place, and the planet at that time was sustainable. Something happened while I was growing up. My generation and the baby boomers before us started to consume. Our appetites for wealth and material possessions were insatiable. 
We consumed far beyond our needs. It became our overriding theme, the context of our lives. Consumption was our way of life and still is. Consumption beyond sustainability. It leaves me breathless. I am amazed and ashamed at the same time. There are now seven billion people on the planet. Powerful pundits believe that our maximum carrying capacity is eight billion. Even at seven billion, we, with our unprecedented wealth, incredible advances in information science and health technologies, we are failing miserably at finding solutions that will steer the planet away from its present suicidal trajectory. Now, I, I know we're all here to inspire and encourage you, but first we need to get real. The planet is on a suicidal trajectory. I'm not as fun as the comedian, am I? <laughs> or, or the magician. Let's start with the human condition, which is something I'm very passionate about. There are 1.5 billion people living on less than a dollar a day. None of us in this room understand what it's like to live on less than a dollar a day. That's a quarter of humankind. Three billion people are living on, on less than two dollars a day, and they are in resource poor countries that have no capacity to build a healthcare system or an education system. 450,000 children die of HIV every year. I'm an AIDS activist. I've been an AIDS physician since 1987. I've watched the miraculous history of this disease, and I know that no child needs to die of HIV. 10 million children under the age of five die annually from preventable diseases, and those diseases are mostly pneumonia, and get this, diarrhea, from unclean drinking water. There are 18 million AIDS orphans, and most of them are tucked right here in my heart. And all this in the setting of unprecedented global wealth, the gap between the rich and the poor is obscene and offensive. Now I'm going to talk about the environment. Mike, I'm sorry, I am not an expert in the environment. I'm an AIDS physician, and the environment is not my area of expertise, but as a global citizen, the health of the environment is my responsibility, so bear with me. We have built industrial civilization and fueled our outrageous appetites for all things material and comfortable using fossil fuels as our primary source of energy. This has huge negative consequences. June was the warmest month on record for the Northern Hemisphere, the 327th consecutive month in which the temperature of the entire globe exceeded the 20th century average. And there are people who say global warming doesn't exist. My husband's an environmentalist, I'm an AIDS activist, and my kids are caught in the middle at the dinner table. <laughs> Scientists, experts in this field from all over the world, have studied the damage that's already been done, Humanity is crossing dangerous boundaries in climate change and pushing limits that will exceed the planet's ability to recover. Radical climate change is here. It's already baked into the system. No one really understands where the point of no return is or what will happen if we cross it. We've listened to one person who's motivated to do something about this, and believe me, it takes a tremendous amount of work to start your own organization and start a movement. You have to live and breathe this stuff every day. But where is the motivation to create and expand new energy technologies? Who is leading this very necessary effort? What are we doing about this? If we bury our collective heads in the sand, won't our butts just get burned along with the planet? Your world is in big trouble. I'm entering the final third of my life, and I could easily slip into a nice, cushy retirement, hoping that I die before it all comes crashing down. And I think that's what most of us think. It's not our problem. We'll be dead before it all disintegrates. But you, your lives are just beginning, and we have left you a catastrophic mess. I'm just not into cushy retirements. So what if we do something about this? You and me, us, everyone, 
all seven billion of us. What would the wor world look like in a hundred years if today we all took action? Before you looms three massive global crises, humanitarian, environmental, and economic. All three have exploded into the 21st century and laying quietly beside them are eight beautiful goals that most people aren't even aware of. The United Nations Millennium Development Goals. Here they are. I love these. Don't mind me if I start to cry a little bit. They're amazing. These were created by world leaders at the UN Millennium Conference in September of 2000. I'm going to bring each one up separately. Read them, revel in them, absorb them, but most importantly, believe in them. Cut the worst of poverty and hunger in half. We could do that. Achieve universal primary education. We must do this. Everyone's entitled to at least a primary education. Promote gender equality. Sorry, guys, but it's high time this happened. Three women won the Nobel Peace Prize last year. It was awesome. Awesome. Can you imagine if we gave every oppressed woman on the planet freedom to use her intellect, her creativity, and her power, these problems wouldn't exist in the first place. Reduce by two-thirds the under-five child mortality rate. Children dying of diarrhea is just not acceptable. Reduce by three-quarters the maternal mortality rate. Women dying in childbirth because of no access to health care, also not acceptable. And my baby, halt and reverse the devastation of HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. We have the pharmaceutical tools to not only make HIV, AIDS a chronic, manageable illness, but because treatment stops transmission, you got to hear that. Canadian researchers in 2010 re uh, released at a World AIDS conference the fact that treatment stops transmission. We could end the pandemic in my lifetime, and I am old. This is Mike's Ensure Environmental Stability. What is the point of pursuing these goals of hoping for tomorrow if the planet can no longer sustain us? And I love this one. Develop a global partnership for development. Stop the burgeoning gap between the rich and the poor. Make the world an even playing field for all of us. Eight beautiful goals. I have an idea. I've witnessed what happens when a community of ordinary citizens is inspired to take action around one of these goals. In 1987, I was lucky enough to be a 23-year-old second-year medical student doing an elective in Nova Scotia, and I followed the infectious disease team, and they prescribed the first dose of AZT to the first patient on the East Coast. That inspired me, but what inspired me more was the patient. I was amazed at his level of isolation. He was abandoned by everyone. He was stigmatized and marginalized. And as a small town Ontario girl, I had never seen anything like it. He inspired me to go back to medical school and learn as much as I could about this disease. In 1990, I opened a family practice in Guelph and started seeing seven HIV-positive men. I called them the group of seven. And I loved every one of them. In 1996, antiretrovirals came on board, combining three medications instead of just using one. And the effects were miraculous. Only two of my group of seven were still alive at that time, but I prescribed these drugs to them. And one month later, I got their viral load test result back, and it was undetectable, no virus detectable in their blood. And they'd come into the office, and I'd never seen them healthy. And here were these young, healthy men restored to health. We call it the Lazarus effect, and it's the miracle of modern medicine. In 2005, I was the only physician left in this area of southwest Ontario that was seeing HIV patients, so I needed to make a decision about whether to close my door to any more patients. And a friend of mine who runs the clinic in Windsor said, you need to open up an HIV clinic that's provincially funded. 
okay, I'm a mom, I'm a family doctor, I treat AIDS, I don't open up clinics. But the opportunity presented itself. And one of the take-home message I'd like you to get is, if the opportunity presents itself, don't be afraid of it, especially if the outcome of pursuing that opportunity leads to the betterment of humankind. Be courageous, move forward, and be relentless. We opened that clinic in 2005 because of the support of my community. It took us only 15 months to get the funding where we were told there was no funding. I was so impressed by what Guelph did, I'm from Guelph, and the support that we received, that I then turned to that community and I asked them to help me raise a million dollars for the first HIV AIDS clinic in Lesotho, Africa. I really had no idea what I was doing, really, and I had no idea how it was going to happen. I just asked ordinary people to stand up and do something, and they did. Within two and a half years, that million dollars was raised, and it kept 11,000 people alive at the Sepong HIV AIDS clinic throughout the operating year of 2009. Here's the idea. What if we kept going, and we will, <coughs> our little charity? inspiring Canadian communities and citizens to activate their efforts ending the pandemic in one country, accomplishing Millennium Development Goal number six. When we succeed, the whole world will know that it's possible, not just to accomplish one, but to accomplish them all. This is massive. This is the game changer. This could create the tipping point that leads the planet to healing and restoration, and the goals are right before you. When the world leaders put all these goals into place, they forgot two pieces in their efforts to achieve them, and they need to be achieved by 2015, and they won't be. Those two pieces they forgot were you and me, civil society. We are the answer. You are. I am, along with eight billion of us, stand up, use our global wealth and technologies and the world's global intellectual property to set us on a path to healing, activate civil society, gain the cooperation of as many people as possible, and involve them in efforts that work to accomplish each goal. See to it that by the next century, the planet and humankind are restored and preserved. In return, we will receive what the poor seem to have in abundance and what we've lost in these last decades of affluence and massive consumerism, community, generosity, decency, and soul. This is my favorite quote. I try to live by this. I'm convinced being generous is a better way to live. I am convinced having compassion is a better way to live, fighting against famine, debt, Poverty, oppression, despair, death, slaughter, injustice, loneliness, and suffering for all mankind is a better way to live. And at this moment on this planet, in the face of these three global, global crises, this is the only way to live. Thank you.